Yes, he is. Praise the name of the Lord. We had an awesome service this morning with my former pastor and uh, missionary to Guatemala, uh, Pastor Frankie Tyson and his wife Joyce. We just had a lot of opportunity to bring back some fond memories. I, it's probably the first time we've had to eat a meal together in 20 years. But uh, I'm telling you, we had an awesome time together as we served in ministerial internship and um, done all the things that we do for ministry. And uh, they are returning to Guatemala uh, in November, and I'm excited. They're, they're going to undergird pastors that are there and to sort of strengthen them and, and be an encouragement to them because, I'll be honest with you, sometimes pastoring, and in the States we've got it made compared to some of the guys, you know, in the, in the mission field. But they go through the same spiritual struggles that we go through in the States, but they live in very, very meager and some, you know, uh, uh, some, sometimes modest conditions, but most of the time it's very meager conditions. In 19, or rather 2001, I spent 12 days in Barranquilla, Colombia, and uh, it was very, very different. But uh, I've told the Lord, we'll do more in missions this year than we've ever done before. God's going to help us. While we give more missions than we've ever given before, God will give back more than He's ever given before. And uh, God's going to see us through to great and awesome things. Quick update. Uh, some of you know and you have driven by. I know some days I've made as many as four and five trips to the property. And uh, walking around, praying, seeking the Lord, shooting videos, and you just name it. Um, we're doing it. We're dreaming about it. Um, and they tell me they'll have it cleared uh, most likely this week, about seven days total for the clearing. Some of it has been held up waiting on getting the, the silt fence up because you can get in trouble with the EPA if you breathe wrong when you start building something. That's the last thing we need to do is get in trouble with the EPA. But uh, anyway, we're excited about it. I, I'm excited. I, you know, I see something going on. I know that God is up to some great and mighty things. I see... The structure of the church has been changing. We've been preparing our hearts for a harvest. We, we, we've restructured a lot of our ministries, and, and there's more to come. We've restructured totally the administrative side of the house, and we're putting things in place. And someone might ask, well, why are we doing this, and why do we have to do that and the other? Because what we've been doing, though we thank God for it, and though we've grown immensely to this point, that will not take us to the next level. Amen? Amen. And so change is involved, and so God is helping us. And I want you to be a part of what God is doing here at the Harbor Worship Center. My goal is not to ostracize people or, 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 or say, no, you cannot do that or this or the other, but my goal is to line up gifts and callings and talents with the jobs at hand, and we've got more jobs than we have workers right now. So we're looking. Now, we're looking for people that are eager to do something in the kingdom of God. Amen? We're looking for people that are eager to be team players and not an island unto themselves. Because I want to tell you something. I have learned this over all the years of ministry, that when the tide comes in, all the ships in the harbor rise. Huh? When the tide comes in, if you go down there, you don't see one boat at this level and another at this level. When the tide comes in, all the boats in St. Mary's come up. And when the tide goes out, all of them go down at the same time. Are you all with me? Say amen. We've got plenty of work to go around. So let me just encourage you. If your department has been struggling or, or, or you're just wondering, man, I'm just not making it. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. Don't be dismayed. Don't throw your hands up and say, well, I guess it's not for me. No. Come to us and talk to us and say, you know what? This is not working right here, but surely there's something I can do in the kingdom of God, and we will align it somehow. We will fix it somehow to where you are utilized in the kingdom of God, and the lie of the devil is to say that you're dispelled, thrown away, cast aside. That's not the case at all. We want to put the best people in the best places for those jobs. Are you hearing me say amen? I have no business you know, in the sound room trying to, uh, to adjust levels or uh, even in the youth department trying to minister to the youth 
or with the lights or whatever, but there's a lot of work out. There's a lot of jobs. So I'm excited about it. I'm here to tell you that God is doing some miraculous things. And um, we have got about seven, seven and a half, maybe eight months to have ourselves totally prepared to enter that sanctuary out there for the first time. We will have one opportunity to make a first impression. We will have one shot to be ready. So, my goal is and my role is as the senior pastor is to have our leaders ready and equipped to handle ministry. The role of any pastor is simply this, to equip the saints of God for works of ministry. So for the next eight months, you're going to see me, and not just eight months, but on and on, my role is to equip the men and women in the house of God to do ministry themselves. Are you hearing me? More and more, you're seeing things that are handled by other members of the church or other staff members, and, and you're going to see more and more some of that going on. And even the department leaders will be handing off more tasks. Everybody trying to learn how to, to uh, let someone else handle. John Maxwell says, if it can be delegated, then delegate it. Give somebody an opportunity to spread their wings in ministry. Got that off my chest. So now it's time to go to our word. And uh, I want to say to you that um, last week we had an awesome time together. We had a great time today. Um, we got a number of folks that are sick, a number of folks that are away. But uh, we're going to pray for them. And you know what? Pastor Dawson told me years ago, he said, Pastor, at any given time you're going to have about 30% of your congregation gone, and if you talk to almost any pastor, they're going to tell you that. I've got the list. i got the list of every family that wasn't here this morning. I promise you I could email them right now. But right now I've got to preach, so I'm not going to do that. But uh, nonetheless, well, last week we talked about training disciples. Training disciples is important. Are you with me? You know why? Because aren't we about, oh, I'm sorry, college and career. God bless you. I've been wondering why people are looking at me kind of, <laughs> Thank you, uh, Brother Eddie. Uh, God bless you, college and career. Let me get back to this. All right, they're gone. Don't worry about them. They're going to take care of them down there. Be blessed as you go. We talked about training disciples. Training disciples is important, is it not? It is very important because if I'm doing my job, I'm training disciples. For me to neglect training disciples is to... Uh, to have dereliction of duty and to omit what I ought to be doing. So we are to train disciples. In fact, if you want to know uh, in a nutshell what you, you can tell people we do, they say, well, we're the Harbor Worship Center, THWC. We train disciples. We help others to worship Christ. So last week we talked about training disciples, and that's important. And I want to thank you, those who came for the Sunday night. I was over at the Lighthouse Church for the district uh, meeting there with the overseer. Uh, then today we talked about helping others. That's what missionaries do. They help others. And he tied that into his theme this morning. Tonight I want to talk with you further about helping others. And of course next week we're going to talk about worshiping Christ. Now, let me turn your attention to 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to read verses 1 through 4 and then 8 through 11. And I believe it's there on the screen for you. Notice with me Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and to Timothy our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth and with all the saints which are, who are in Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God of the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation. Watch this. That, say this with me. That we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble. In other words, God comforts us so that we can comfort who? Those who are in trouble. What With what? With the same comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted. So God says that we are to be a... You're going through what you're going through right now. The hardship, the hell, the headache, the malady sickness, disease, oppression, depression, whatever it is, you're going through it, and the Holy Spirit is here to comfort you. 
not just to comfort you and get you through. This is a mistake that the world and the church has made today that we feel like if we can get through, if we can make it, if I can overcome... It's not enough for you to take the journey, friend. It is not enough for you to be in the house of God. It is not complete until you bring somebody with you. It is not complete until you have witnessed. As Pastor said this morning, we are all witnesses of Jesus Christ. So we have been comforted so that in turn we can comfort others who are going through what we've already been through. So you went through it so you can tell somebody else, hey, the Holy Spirit came to me and He comforted me and He ministered to me. And if He ministered to me and got a hold of me and encouraged me and I made it through, your witness to them is, if I made it, you can make it also. If I'm here today, you will be here tomorrow if the Lord tarries. Now, notice verses 8 through 11 with me. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of the trouble which came to us in Asia. How many of you know the Apostle Paul had trouble too? Yeah. He said um, that we were burdened beyond measure. I'm going to tell you something. Pastors, uh, and, and I don't want to sound like I'm on a pity pot, so don't feel sorry for me. I'm not, I'm just, just, let me just tell you, Paul had a lot on him. He's looking after a lot of churches. And you know what? There's all, you can't please everybody. I've done quit trying. Amen? You just can't do it. It's an impossibility. And you know, if we got a little consensus together and got all the elders together and the advisory board together and we come up with what pleased all of us, it wouldn't please all of y'all. That's just how it is. And so he said, he, he said, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. In other words, uh, he, he said, the trouble that come to us in Asia, we were burdened beyond measure and even above our strength. We were burdened above strength. In other words, we didn't even have the strength to bear the burden that we, we were uh, tasked with. He said, and we even despaired of life. In other words, we thought we were going to die. Such a heavy load. Such a burden. And you know, I've had people, I, I, I've got one or two friends that I can really just share my heart with. I just have to count them out. You know, no, I mean, it, maybe it's more than that, but it's not many more than that. Somebody that you can absolutely be... 100% just how it is with. I mean, see, Facebook's redefined what friends are. That's not friends. That's just acquaintances for the most part. You don't have one-tenth of the friends. They say they're friends. It's a much smaller number. But to be able to just bear your soul with someone, to tell them exactly what's going on, Paul said we despaired even of our life. We felt like dying. Yes, he says, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from a great death uh, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us. Listen, as the pastor said this morning, if you didn't give a dime, if you could just pray genuinely for us, he says, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift, and they did raise an offering, that was granted uh, to us through many. So they prayed for him and they gave to him and all of that. Now, gets me to my real introduction. Uh, it took that long to read the text. But uh, today we live in a world with, with people that have no concept of what it means to help someone else. Are you hearing me? We live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You are very skeptical about what you do. Matter of fact, if Kelly's in the truck with me, I can just about forget picking up anybody uh, if they need a ride. Uh, because the world we live in it has gotten so bad, you never know. Matter of fact, the other day, when last Sunday night or Monday, I don't remember which one it was. It's been such a busy week. Um, I, I came through the drive through It was late, me getting back home, and uh, very late, and I pulled into McDonald's to hit the drive through you know. And through there, there was a guy there, big, burly guy, and he was asking people for rides. And, uh, you know, he comes to me, hey, 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 is there any way I can get a ride to Walmart? I said, well, well what's going on? He said, my car broke down. My time and bottle broke. And I said, well, I'm selling Walmart. You know, oh, if I can get to Walmart, I can get a ride. Hey, I ain't going to hurt you. I 
whatever, and thought to myself, most of the time I've got a Ruger 9 millimeter right here in the door. I didn't have that. I said, well, you know, it's late, but uh, I reached down and I did have my hunting knife. I said, well, get in. <laughs> and I thought to myself as I unsnapped that hunting knife, it's going to be bad if this guy decides to get nutty on me. Are you all with me? Say amen. I'm just giving you the mindset. I have that as a man. How much more? I mean, everybody, we live in a society where people will just kill somebody over 50 cents. But I took him to Walmart. Very appreciative. I say, God bless you and, you know, be blessed and all that stuff. But uh, we have to be careful. And so we as a church, a Christian church, we have got where we're scared to, to help anybody. And there's another thing, too, that sometimes if you help someone, you're scared that it's going to become a way of life for them. Are you all with me? I'm not speaking Greek tonight. So we live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It is a world where everybody is out of themselves. And the big question that is asked today is, what is in it for me? What's in it for me? And, and I'll be honest with you, I don't know tonight if we have uh, visitors in the house with us because I can't hardly see you. But I know this, most people come to churches nowadays and they wonder what is in it for me. Yeah, I mean, I know that's a sad uh, commentary, but that's where we're at. What, what is there for my children? What kind of preacher preaching do you have? What kind of music do you have? What kind of facilities do you have? What, what kind of programs and small groups, et cetera, et cetera? There seems to be no time in our schedules to help somebody, to genuinely help somebody that's in need, someone that is less fortunate than us, perhaps someone who don't have all the skills that we have. Maybe you know how to put that fence up your neighbor's been struggling with, and you just say, you know what, I ain't got time. And maybe you don't. Maybe the Lord hasn't dealt with you about it. But I know we live in this dangerous world, but I want to tell you something. You and I cannot and will not be excused from the leading and the moving of the Holy Spirit when He tells us to help someone. If the Lord moves upon you to help someone, I don't care what color they are, I don't care what uh, side of the tracks they live on, it doesn't matter if you're in Walmart, Kmart, or McDonald's, or in the church. We need to be led by the Spirit. We need to know the voice of God so that we can help others when the Lord says help them. If we close up our bowels of compassion, if we close down our heart and say, well, we've been hurt so many times, well, so many people are getting killed, well, this, well, that, then we will refuse to help anyone. And if we don't help them, we cannot show the love of God, the way God wants us to show it. You see, um, if we decide that we're never going to help anyone, then we cannot and will not represent Jesus, nor will we show the love of God that passes all understanding. Now, let me read this to you, and then I want to share a website with you in just a moment, and I know it's a little unorthodox, a little different, but Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says this, that two are better than one. Isn't that right? Two are better than one. How many of you ever went to a park and you wanted to ride something scary and you looked at your friend and said, if you ride, I'll ride. Huh? Come on now. Have you ever went to, I know Halloween's coming. Some of y'all went to the scary houses and some of y'all are spooky that way. Huh? And you said things like, I'll go in if you go in because we know that two are better than one. Isn't that right? Because they have a good reward, the Word says, for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. So if we're walking along together and I fall, you can help me up, or vice versa. But woe unto him when he falls if he has no one to help him. You're in trouble. If you have no one to help you. Again, two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. And see, we need, we need each other. Isn't that right? We need each other. Uh, I had a situation here just a few months ago. Uh, Adam was driving down the road and right uh, in front of uh, old school classics, and there had been a wreck, a motorcycle wreck in the road, and there was some nutball, I don't know what he was doing, standing way out in the middle of the road. They've already moved all the motorcycles, all the EMTs, got everybody over the side of the road, but this one guy is way out in the road, and I guess Adam come a little too close to him for his comfort, so he ran us down at Subway. 
So he runs us down, and of course he wants to have a word with Adam. And his demand is that you're going to go down there and apologize to them people. And Adam said, well, I apologize. He said, no, no, you're going to go down there and apologize. And Adam said, no, sir, that's not going to happen. He said, you can go tell them I did apologize. And I'm standing there, and A.J.'s standing there, and little Micah's standing there, all these things, boys. And I'm thinking to myself that now you might whip Adam, but you ain't going to whip all four of us. Are you with me? <laughs> And, of course, I didn't want it to come to that, and he didn't want it to come to that, and it didn't come to that. I'm just simply saying we didn't want to have to get Micah out of his carrier to take care of this, right? I'm simply saying two is better than one. Three is even better than two. And when it comes down to it, you're the very same way. If it comes down to you and your family, you're going to say, hey, you might get one, but you ain't getting all of us. Amen. Now, I want to share this website with you, if I may, and maybe, maybe perhaps Tanya will be able to have it um, available. And I just want to read some of this for you. Oh, Lord, I hope I can. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll try to go through this quick. I, I just want you to see it. The last slide is really what's important. We convince ourselves that life will be better when we're married or have a baby or maybe even another. And then we get frustrated because our children are not old enough. And that all, you know, we think all will be well if they'll just get older. And then we're frustrated when they reach adolescence and we've got to deal with them. And then surely we'll be happier when they grow out of those teen years. So we tell ourselves that life will be better when our spouse uh, gets his or her act together. And uh, we'll have a nicer car maybe. And we can take a vacation. We can maybe finally retire. We're always looking for the BBD, right? The bigger, better deal. Y'all hearing me? The truth is that there is no better time to be happy than right now. So if not now, when? Okay? So your life will always be full of challenges. Like Paul said, man, we had so many challenges. It's full of challenges. It is better to admit as, uh, as, as, it's better to admit as much and then decide to be happy in spite of all of that. Next slide. He says, for the longest time, it seemed that life was about to start. In other words, we're about to have real life. But there was always some obstacle along the way, some ordeal to get through, some work to be finished, some time to be given, a bill to be paid, and then we'll really start life. Finally come to understand that those obstacles were life. Y'all hear me? Those obstacles, you know, the things that crop up, life happens. Can you hear me say amen? Amen. Life just happens. See, the point of this point of view, he says, that helped me to see that there isn't a road to happiness. Happiness is the road. Watch. So enjoy every moment. Stop waiting for school to end, for a return to school, to lose 10 pounds or gain 10 pounds or for work to begin or to get married or for Friday to come or Sunday to come, waiting for a new car, the mortgage to be paid or, uh, you know, the end of the month or the first of the 15th or, you know, stop all of that. Next slide. Because life happens. Happiness, they say, is a voyage, not a destination. There's no better time to be happy than now. So live and enjoy the moment. Now, here's a little test, and, and this is building up to something. I, I just want you to bear with me for just a second. I promise you we'll preach this out. I want you to think and try to answer these questions. I want you to name in your mind the five richest people in the world. Name the last five Miss Universe winners, the most in their opinion, beautiful women in the world. Name the last ten Nobel uh, Prize winners. Name the last ten winners of the Best Actor Oscar. So, can't do it, right? Pretty difficult. I couldn't do it. Are you with me? So, uh, you see, here's what he says. The applause dies away. Trophies gather dust. Winners are soon forgotten. But now answer these questions. Name three teachers who contributed to your education. I bet you can immediately start thinking, my fifth grade teacher, my ninth grade teacher, my college professor. Name three friends who have helped you in your hour of need. Think of a few people who made you feel special. Name five people that you would like to spend time with. That, you know, isn't that more manageable? Isn't that easier to do? You see, the people who mean something to you in life they're not rated the best. They're not the richest people. They're not the prettiest people. They, they don't have all the trophies and the greatest prizes. You see, um, the people that, that have molded you and that have done something in your life are really nobodies to some other folks. They were special to you. You with me? 
Now, think about it for a moment. Life is very short, and you, uh, which list are you on? Next slide. Notice this. I want to give you a hand. You, he, he says, notice this. Some time ago in the Seattle Olympics, this is a good illustration. We'll get to the gist of it. There were nine, the Seattle Olympics, there were nine athletes. All of them were mentally or physically challenged. They were standing on the start line for a 100-meter race. The gun fired, and the race began. Not everyone was running, but everyone wanted to participate and win. They ran in threes. A boy tripped, and he fell and did a few somersaults and started crying. The other eight heard him crying. They slowed down and looked behind them. They stopped and came back, all of them. A girl with Down syndrome sat down next to him, hugged him, and asked, Feeling better now? Then all nine walked shoulder to shoulder to the finish line. The whole crowd stood up and applauded, at the apl and the applause lasted a very long time. So people who witness this still talk about it. Why? Because deep down inside us, we all know that the most important thing in life is much more than winning for ourselves. Listen, here's the crux. The most important thing in this life is to help others to win. I want to say that again. The most important thing in this life is to help others to win. One of the greatest revelations the Lord ever gave me was that if I would find somebody and help their dream to come true, that he would make sure my dreams came true. Are you with me? That if I would find somebody that seems down and out, somebody, and I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I've done it over the years. I've gone on the, the softball field and seen somebody that couldn't catch. Rather than make fun of them, I tried to help them learn to catch. If I went to see someone doing something, if I knew how to do it, I would be a help if I could be a help. And I said, Lord, I don't ever want to be part of making them feel insignificant or insufficient or incapable of. Are you with me? You help them and watch their dream come true, and God will make sure yours comes true. So the greatest thing we can do is the most important thing in life is to help other people win, even if that means slowing down and changing our own race. That means even if it impedes or slows our progress, it's more important to help somebody else win than it is for us to be first. I'm going to tell you something. If we would all get that between our ears, if we would get that lodged in our head, that if we could help others to win, I'm telling you, the new church wouldn't hold the people in the first year. Are you hearing me? We would learn that other people... You see, if you give uh, uh, to others, perhaps we will succeed in changing our heart. Perhaps someone else's heart Will change as well. Thank you for that slide, Sister Tanya. Now, I want to share with you a, a quick story, and you know the story, and I just want to share it with you, make a few comments, and then and, and move on. Jesus said in Luke 10 and 25 uh, through 37, he said, on an occasion, this is the NIV version, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life. What is written in the law? Jesus asked. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell in the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So, too, a Levite, when he came to the place, he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, he came where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own tree, took him to an inn, took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and he gave them to the innkeeper. 
after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Isn't that awesome? So, the question begs, who are we to help? If I can frame it for you right, this Samaritan was a half-breed Jew. Are y'all hearing me? They were despised by the Jews because they were not full-blooded. They were half-breeds. They were culls. They were rejects. Now, the priest obviously handled the things at the synagogue. The Levites obviously handled the things about the altar. That was their calling. That was the job of these men. They had the charge of the church of that day. Are you with me? Say amen. And the Bible said that Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves. So the world has been in bad shape for a long time. It's not just now. Uh, but this man fell among thieves and they robbed him of his goods. They stripped him of his clothes and they left him lying for dead. Are you hearing me? Now a priest, you would think, would have compassion and help others. But how many of you know if you want to, you can always appeal to the law? How many of you know if you want to do certain things, you can find a scripture back at what you want to do, pretty much? Everybody's got their scripture. If you don't believe it, call the uh, Democrats or the Republicans, and they can come up with a poll to support their position. Well, the priest comes and sees him lying for dead. And he walks way over on this side of the road. Because Paul tells us that a priest was not to touch anything dead or be near anything dead or dying. Are y'all hearing me? So I've got scriptures to back up my sanctimonious self. So I don't have to help him. I'm just trying to help somebody right now, if I may. And then another... Uh, a uh, worker of the church comes by. It's a Levite. He comes by and he sees him and he also runs over to this side of the road or the other side of the road, the Bible said, no, so as not to soil his hands with the situation either. He refused to help others. Now I'm going to tell you something. If you want to show the love of God, if you want to show the love of Christ, you can do that every day in so many ways by helping others. How, what, what are you saying, Pastor? Well, you can help somebody. It might be just you holding up for a second and letting somebody get into the traffic rather than bulldogging them and saying, Get out of here, I was here first. And especially if you've got the harbor sticker on your car. Huh? that you could smile cordially at somebody that just pulled out in front of you because they didn't mean to, they just didn't see you. And rather than show them a fourth of your hand, you could just give them a hallelujah. Right? Say, God bless you. Be safe. Keep your eyes open. You know, whatever. Anyway. So, uh, so how am I going to help? Well, then the Bible said the Samaritan come along the road. The Samaritan is a half feet to that has no dealings with the Jews, but he this man is in bad shape. And guess what? This is, this is, what an indictment against the church. Watch. If the church won't help, God will use an old half-breed Samaritan to do what the church should have. Y'all hear me? The church refused. Two officials of the church refused to offer any help. So here comes somebody that couldn't even go to church there. Huh. He was not of the right stock to go to church there. Y'all hearing me? But he had the love of God in his heart, and he decided to help others. And he took this man that's lying at the point of death. He pours his oil and, you know, caresses his wounds and uh, gives him of his drink 
and he lifts him up and sets him on his donkey, which means he had to walk and he carries him to an inn somewhere. He goes in and secures a room for a man that he don't even know. And by the way, he's not the same breed. And he says, I want to look after him. He said, I've got business. I've got to go on, but please look after him. And if you spend anything else while I'm gone, just put it on my account, and when I come back through, I'll pay it. That, and Jesus asked this lawyer, who do you think was a neighbor to the man that fell among thieves? And he said, well, the one that had compassion on him. Jesus simply said, go and do it like Go do you likewise. So Jesus is telling us, let's show some compassion. He's saying, let's help others. So how? I'm glad you asked. We'll talk. Let, let, me, let me just move a little. You see, these, I, I preached a message years ago uh, that, um, my goodness. In fact, my pastor, Ray Dawson, uh, showed me this concept years ago. He said, one of these come by with the attitude about helping that said uh, their attitude was, or rather, what's yours is mine and we're going to take it. That's the people that robbed him. What's yours is mine we're going to take it. And the other guy come by and says, what's mine is mine I'm going to keep it. That's what the priest and the Levite did. What's mine is mine I'm going to keep it. And then finally, the Samaritan come by and said, what's mine is yours, and I'm going to share it. Are you with me? They decided to help others. So, now, let me just say this as I'm trying to tie this thing up. In Hebrews 13, the Bible says, Do not neglect to do good and share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing unto God. Y'all hearing me? He says, don't neglect to do good and share what you have. For these sacrifices are pleasing unto God. Philippians 2 and 4 says, Let each of you not look on his own interest, but also on the interest of other people. Luke 6 and 38 says, Give and it will be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. He said it's going to be put into your lap, for with the same measure that you use, it's going to be measured back to you. In 1 John, John said, But anyone has the world's goods, that is money, that is possessions, that is things, articles, clothing, on and on. He said, if you've got these world's goods and you need to close up your heart against them, how does the love of God abide in you? You see, we can show the world that we're a loving church by helping others. Y'all hear me? I know sometimes you can get burned. You're going to change somebody's tire and they're never going to come to the house of God. You're going to send somebody, you know, uh, uh, somewhere and help them buy them a tank of gas or something, they're never going to show up. You're going to take somebody some groceries, they're not going to show up. You're going to buy diapers and formula, they're not going to show up. But let me say this, what you do, you do heartily as unto the Lord, and God sees it. And while they may not show up, God will send somebody else. So Matthew says, uh, Jesus talking, for I was hungry and gave me food and you gave me drink, stranger, and you welcomed me, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you stranger, and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And he said, when you, and when you did, you see the sick and in prison, you visit you. When did we do that? And he says, inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. So James, he says, what good is it, brother? James 2 and 14 if someone says he has faith, and, but he has no works, can faith save him alone? Or if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving him the things he needs for his body, what good is that? So that faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Are you hearing me? Somebody comes in our midst right through that door, and they're sitting there, and they tell us, we are hungry and we haven't ate a thing. And we say, we're praying for you, brother. God bless you. God's going to meet your need. And every one of us have got groceries in the pantry. We've got even the foods that we don't really care about that we're going to really save them to last. You know, if it get really bad, if none of us goes home and gets that box of macaroni and cheese or a can of green beans or a pork roast or whatever it is, if none of us goes and gets him anything, shame on us because we have professed to have something that we do not have, or perhaps we have something and will not share. And God says, if you will not share, I will take what you even have. So how dwelleth the love of God in us if we see our brother or neighbor or sister 
in destitution and need, and we don't do anything about it. I'm going to tell you something. I'm a firm believer in this, that we as the people of God, if I have a piece of bread, you have a piece of bread. Are you hearing me? It, it, you know, we're to look after. I won't never forget. It's been years ago now when Hurricane Floyd threatened us. If you remember that, I, I remember it big time. Man, we taped up windows and we did this and we done that and we tried to put together some sort of chain uh, of command, especially for our seniors to be able to somehow find out where they were at and if they were okay and if they were safe or warm and all those things. And that was way back then. How much better will it be now? Uh, anyway, so Galatians 6 and 2, Paul said, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. John said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus loved us enough to die for us, to lay down his life for us. Proverbs said in 1917, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deeds. Oh, that's good, isn't it? He said, whoever is generous to the poor, it's, almost, it's like you gave the Lord a loan, and the Lord pays back. Are you with me? So it's not like we're just throwing it away. God has a way of sending it again and again. He says, uh, Matthew 5 and 16, In the same way, let your light shine before us that they'll see your good works and glorify, give glory to your fathers in heaven. We must help one another. We've got to help other people. Now, I'm telling you, if people look at us and say, well, it's all about them. It's all about their status their church or their building or their logo. That logo and that building and that means absolutely nothing. If we are not the people of God filling that building up, it means nothing. 28.8 acres means nothing if we're not doing the mission of God on it. Amen? It is nothing. Yeah, I know the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, but God has given us that property and this vision that we might help others. So you know what? We've got to get in an attitude of helping others. And you know what? If everybody will get in that mindset of helping others, oh, my goodness gracious, what is going to happen around here? You see... Proverbs 2 and, or 22 and 9 says, What a bountiful eye. Uh, whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. Uh, Matthew 5 and 42, Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, I understand, folks. Please, don't get me wrong. I understand. And I've had to make these decisions over the years. I know that people learn who is benevolent and who will give to a cause. And I understand that, that um, the drug-infested world will take advantage of that. And I can discern it that fast. I don't have to be around a drug head but just a few seconds before my internal uh, spirit has already said this is not what is being purported. This is not what is... You know, giving you some big song and dance, but hey, it's not my first rodeo. But, you know, even saying that, we're still going to be burned at times. Y'all with me? I understand we have to have guidelines, and, and we, we cannot just do... I understand, so please don't say... I'm not saying go sell your car and give away your house. And If God tells you to do that, by all means, get rid of it tonight. But, but use some sense. But don't close up all of your heart just because a few people burned you. Now, whoever has that bountiful eye is going to be blessed if he shares his bread with the poor. Give to that one who begs from you. Do not refuse to the, those who would borrow. Listen, he says in Matthew thirteen or 5 and 13, because what? We are the salt of the earth. What does salt do? Does anybody know? Have you ever ate butter beans with no salt? They ain't worth a flip. They will keep you alive. I mean, I, I was going to say throw them out the back door, but they will keep you alive. They just don't taste worth a flip. Because salt, although it runs your blood pressure up, uh, it seasons the food. It makes it appealing. It makes it taste good. Are you hearing me? And the Bible says you and I are the salt of the earth. 
The salt also has another property about it. It's a cleanser. It's a purifier. Did you know in days gone by, they would pour salt in wounds? Yeah, it hurt, but it'll clean. Are you hearing me? Salt. It's a purifier. It's a preserver. Huh? They talk about a salt-cured ham, right? Country ham. Y'all hearing me? So he said, we are the salt. We are uh, th- that that enhances, that that cleans up, that pr- that preserves. We are the salt of the earth, he says. But if the salt has lost its savor, if it's not salty anymore, wherewith shall the earth be salted? Years ago I preached a message entitled, Are You Salty Anymore? People looked at me like I was crazy. You know, but um, that's a good question. He said, and you are the light of the world. If we're the light of the world, friend, I'm telling you, if the light of the world is living inside of us, then that makes us the light of the world. We're supposed to be shining our light. Are y'all hearing me? Listen, God, Hebrews 6 and 10 says, God is not unjust so as to overlook our work and the love that you have shown for His name in serving the saints as you still do. Listen, God is not going to overlook that that we've done. Are you hearing me? God is not going to overlook that that we have done. I'm getting ready to tie this thing up. Sister Becky, would you help me at the piano? I don't, I can't see nobody, but I see you, and I know you play. So, uh, if you would help me, I, I want to say this: the whole thing, in a nutshell, is this: we better be willing to help others. Are you hearing me? We've got to be willing to help others. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And I'm going to ask someone, if, Brother Eddie, if you could help me bring the lights up a little. Because the Word says, Greater love has no man than this, that, we would, that he would lay down his life for us. And in Romans, he says, Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So, If we're the salt of the earth and we're the light of the world and we've been instructed by the Lord to give, we've been instructed by the Lord to help, we've been instructed by the Lord to be the people of God. You know, if we are stingy and greedy, that's not showing the love of God, for God is a giver. Huh? If we're mean-spirited and hateful, that doesn't show the love of God because He's a God of mercy and grace. If we are unforgiving, that does not show the love of God because He is forgiving. I saw a message titled today, you'll love this. It's called the real F word, forgiveness. Uh, Some of y'all got scared, I know. I know. You see, God has called us to help others. God has called us to do what nobody else is really willing to do. And that is to help people. And if we somehow, if we default on this duty that God has given us, if we neglect this duty that God has given us, then we are not the ambassador for Christ. If we neglect what He's called us to do, we cannot speak on His behalf. If we don't speak on His behalf, We cannot have the blessings He said He would give us because it was for disobedience that Moses didn't go to the promised land. God spoke, told him to speak to the rock and he struck the rock. And God says, because of this, you're not going to be allowed to go. You can see the promised land from the heights of Mount Pisgah, but you'll never go. God wants us to be His people. He wants us to train disciples. And he wants us to help other people. So now the question must be asked. And you know, I, I, I want to um, I want to do it like this. Listen, the question must be asked, and how can I offer help to someone? How can I help others? What is it that I can do? I don't know anything. Listen, friend, just you turning that old sagging frown into a smile. Did you know if you'll smile at somebody, that's the first step in lighting up their life. Nothing's more aggravating than to see someone you know and then keep an old sullen, mean scowl on their face. You don't know if you ticked them off or if the person they just left did. Right? 
But you had to endure those mean, scowling frown. God's people are not intended to look that way. Does that mean you're never going to be mad? No. Does that mean you're never going to have a bad day? No. But it means, by and large, we ought to be people that are givers. We ought to give out smiles. We ought to give out help. Listen, so how can I help others? Here, here's how. You can help people by smiling. Adam put it in some of our training the other day. I was not here to hear it. But SOP is Standard Operating Procedure. He said, I'm changing that to mean smile on purpose. Smile on purpose. People need to see the children of God smiling. We do have something to smile about. I'll say this, Lord, it's, it, I know what you mean. But if you're reading the Word of God and praying like you ought to be reading and praying, you will be smiling. Because the Word of God is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. It will help you get out of the mully grubs. So, so let me, I, I want to give you something deep here in just a second. I mean, it's just, it, it, it can't, I mean, it's a quote. You can quote me because as far as I know, I came up with it. I don't know how, but it's only God. I'll tell you in a minute what it is, but we can help others. Here's the question. How can I help? How can I help others, Pastor? Well, here it is. You can help others by smiling. You can help others by praying. You can help others by offering assistance to them. You know, they need some help painting that old garage. You can help them. They need some help changing a tire. You can help them. They're building a project. Maybe it's a, a swing set for their kids or grandkids or whatever, and you can help them. And guess what? God's trying to open some doors for you to be the ambassador for Christ. And we're sitting there, oh, I wish I had something to do in the church. Pastor won't let me sing or won't let me do this, won't let me do that. And God's opening all kind of doors. I've had people say, man, I want to do something. I, I'm just not credentialed. Nobody has ever had to have a credential in the church of God to do ministry. I know guys that pastor churches that don't have credential one. I am proud of being an ordained bishop in the church of God. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm happy for that. But let me say this. Adam's been doing ministry for 10 years at the piano. Don't have one license except his driver's license and skydiving and a few things like that. Huh? That paper is important, but it don't make the person. Huh? Brother Aaron's been doing ministry. Josh has been doing ministry. My Lord, I preached over a year, year and a half before I had a license to preach. I've never had anybody say, Pastor Saints, I want to see your preaching license. I never had a roadblock where they asked me for them. You know? They've questioned whether or not I really had a driver's license. But, uh, we can help other people. We don't have to have a great position. We don't have to have a great title. We can just say, I'm called of God. I'm called by the name of Jesus. God has called me, and I can help somebody through prayer, through smiling, through assistance, through that physical help. You listen, you can help through giving. You can help through giving. I understand every one of us can do something. We can give something. Number one, we can tithe. We can give like to missions. I signed up for my credit card withdrawal today. I've got some forms out there. If you didn't and you want to, you can. We can help. I'm going to put together a team and we're going to go to Guatemala and we're going to help build a church. We can help that way. It's going to cost me to go. Yes, it's going to cost me to eat. I've got to eat if I'm here. I've got to eat if I'm there. Huh? So we can help. We can help through giving. Some of us can give more than others. We can help. Uh-oh, now listen. We can help through confronting. There are people right now. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. There's a way to do this. And don't run out here like a banshee Indian now and go murder somebody. Say, well, the pastor said confront it. Bless God. There's a way. I'm telling you, I can talk to you about anything. And believe you me, as a pastor, I've had to. I don't care what it is, whether you're acting up or acting out or acting just right. If I speak to you in love with a heart that cares for you, you know how Moses was able to talk to the people the way Moses was able to talk to the people? Listen, you can talk to the people, and he talked harsh. And Jesus talked harsh. You can talk like that if you love like that. You hearing me? Now, so you can, you can, you can help others by confronting. Listen, if there's issues going on in your life, friends, it's not going to change unless you confront it. When I was raising my kids... 
and they break the curfew and they're supposed to have been in by 10 o'clock and they didn't get there till 10.05. Uh, almost tolerable, not, but it, almost. But then, you know, at, at 10.30, you know what? If I go to bed and don't say nothing about it, guess what? It's going to be 10.45 next week. 11, 11.15. It's until I say, son, you know what time you're supposed to be, or, or daughter, whatever it was. I don't know why it seemed to matter to me more about Carly. Than I, and I'm sorry, all of you parents. I'm, I've got mine raised, praise God. But anyway, I will pray for you. I understand. I, I promise you. <laughs> I promise you I've got the T-shirt and the video. But I'll pray for you. I'll help you. Uh, I'll even come cry with you. Because <laughs> I've been there. Hey, Lord, I'm touching on Now, oh. Uh, Here's, here's the quote that God gave me today. This is just coming from Mycology. You can take it and write it down. But here's what the Lord spoke to me at my desk earlier today. It said, love without legs is hypocritical. Love without legs is hypocritical. I can say, Brother Tyson, be blessed in Guatemala. But unless I send some money across the sea, or I, unless I take my body or take somebody, if I don't do anything, it means nothing. Love without legs is hypocritical. If I tell the brother that walked in, I hope, you, I hope your belly gets full tonight. I hope your five children have something to eat. God bless you, son. I'm praying for you. And if I don't go home and get a can of beans or even a, uh, some vein, a sausage or a hamburger or a piece of deer meat or something, if I don't do something, love without legs is hypocritical. In other words, I have denied the faith and I'm lying when I say God is my God. Wow, Pastor, that's, that's hard, that's cruel. I, I'm going to ask everybody that will. I want you to gather around right now, if you will, right here around the altar. Uh, I, I think it's important tonight as we try to close this service. I think it's so important because because there's something we can do. There's something we can do. You know something, church? Listen. Did you know? Uh, yes, and, and I'm so proud of uh, Aaron and Lisa and their team and Eddie and Denise and their team and all that that's going on with First Impressions. And not just them. I don't mean to, when I say that, don't mean that I'm leaving out all the others because you understand. God bless you. They're there. But there's so much work that can be done. But did you know the people that are, well, not here this morning or tonight, and I'm not really as, as worried about the home folks. That's called maintenance visits. Um, some of them, you know, uh, you always have the sick, lame, and lazy. Those who are genuinely sick, those who are genuinely lame, and those who are genuinely lazy. That, that they just ain't going to get regular. They ain't going to come regular. And ain't nothing you can do about it. But we can show them the love of God. They expect it out of me. The world and even the church will use terms like this. We pay Him to do that. You know, whether or not you believe it that way is irrelevant, but... People look at it. But I'm going to tell you something. If you and you and you and you and you, you get a heart that says, you know what? I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to make this, this brand new person, I'm going to make them feel so special when they come in this house. I'm going to help them. I know they're struggling with whatever it is. I know they, maybe they need clothes. Maybe they, maybe they need a ride somewhere. You find out something. Listen, if you want to be used of God, my friends, you can be used of God. No excuses to say, well, I just didn't know what the church was all doing. Let me tell you something. You are the church. The people are the church. We are the called out of God. You know how to show the love of God. Let me give you a good example. Maybe you're in Burger King tonight, and that person orders in front of you, and they're scrounging, and their order is $10.15, let's say. And they pulled out six, and they, oh, my goodness, they're reaching and they're reaching, and they just don't find no more, and it looks like they're going to have to say, I don't have it. If you have the means, you could just step right up and swipe your debit card and say, it's on me. Jesus loves you. Don't worry about it. No, I don't want your $6. Just be blessed. God loves you. Ooh, son, I felt something when I said that. Let me just tell you, because... You know what? You didn't lift up the name of the harbor. It's really not that important. I want to say this. When people start seeing you as loving people, loving people. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I've been inclined to do that at Walmart before. 
Now, obviously, I'm not going to pay for a 12-pack of Budweiser. I mean, I'm not going to do that, but, but, but somebody's hungry, and, and if I can, I'm going to make a difference. Let, let me just see. So are you willing to help somebody tonight? What, what, is, what does it mean? Well, maybe it's a senior adult that needs a ride somewhere. Maybe it's somebody that needs a tire and they just can't come up with $50 or 100 whatever it is. And maybe you don't have it, but you know somebody that owns a shop or somebody's got a tire and you can get it for 10 or 20 or whatever. Maybe you can help. These are little things, but they are mountainous in the eyes of people. Listen, so you cannot let it slip by tonight while heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We must, hear me when I say it, we must, we absolutely must change our mentality about helping others. We absolutely, we have to about helping people. We, when we help them, I'm going to tell you what happens here. When you help somebody, friend, when you help them, you have gained or rather earned the right to speak into their life. If they are hungry tonight and you happen to buy them a Burger King meal, you have earned the right, I promise you, they will hear you speak into their life for a, a few minutes, whatever it is. I've talked to a couple people. We're going to gather some food this year for Thanksgiving season and we're going to help a lot of families, God helping us. But when we gather food, that's going to give us the right to be able to open the door and say something about Jesus. Friend, listen to me. The mentality of the world is, Pastor, we pay you to do that. You should be talking about feeding these people. You should be the I mean, we've got a, you got a church credit card. Pay for the meal at Burger King. Do this. Do this. No, 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 no. We have to be the church. The way the church grows is for your comrades at work, your people to see you being genuine, being real. Being authentic. And when they see that, I ask you, who are they going to come to when they get tragic news about a disease? They get a bad visit from the doctor or a bad letter in the mail or, or something happens. Who do you think they're going to call on? They're going to call on somebody that they have seen exhibit the love of Jesus. And then you're going to stand in the authority of the Lord and you're going to re reach out and minister to them and before you know it, they will be standing beside you in church because of the life you've lived before. Would you join hands with someone that's near you? I want to pray that God would help us to see the need and the urgency to help others. Lord, I love you right now. I thank you for this beautiful representation of people tonight that love you. I'm asking you, God, right now that as we are assembled here that you would change our minds, soften our hearts, soften my heart, God, because as a pastor I've gotten, I've gotten calloused sometimes and I've been burned so many times, Lord, that my heart sometimes is calloused over and I have to get the opinion sometimes of other people because of just just because of life. But I'm asking you, God, to help us help other people. I know, God, we got a church to build. I understand that. I, I know nobody knows more than, than I what, what we face and what we're up against. But, Lord, I do know you said to help people. You said to show the love of God. You said for us to be an ambassador for Christ. I'm asking you right now, Lord, drop it into the hearts and minds of these that are standing here right now with their hands joined together. Drop into their mind what they're going to do tonight. We have to do something tonight. Something must happen tonight where I help somebody else before I go to bed this night. If there's going to be a change in my life, it's got to start tonight. God, I'm going to do something. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to do something. I don't know who it'll be, but God, you're going to show me between now and Walmart or wherever i got to go tonight, between now and eating at home, between now and Publix, wherever it's at, God, show me. But I'm going to help somebody. 
I'm going to help somebody in the name of Jesus. I'm going to help somebody. Let me tell you something. I had two people, and I'll just leave them nameless, but I, I, had, I had two people when Kelly got sick and was in the hospital. And I, I had so many people hit me up on Facebook, so many of you asking. And, I, and finally, I finally started cutting and pasting everything I was saying because I, I just couldn't type that many responses to everybody. And I had some local pastors that called me and uh, asked about her and all that. And I had someone bring us a big old uh, pot of hot soup that night. I got her home. Next day, I had somebody stop by and brought a fifty-dollar ham, cut and sugar cured and spiral and all that. And I said, "My Lord, have mercy." And that makes you feel good that somebody cared enough to say, "You know what? With all that's going on and this and that and the other, I'm just going to go do something. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do something. I don't know if they like this. I don't know if they like that. But I'm going to do something. What a blessing!" What a blessing. And friends, you can do that in the lives of other people. And they will light up like a Christmas tree inside their heart. You might not see it, I promise you it happened. God granted that we might be helpers of one another. From this night forward, in the name of Jesus, I call it done. Amen. Amen. Would you shake someone's and now, do we have announcements? Am I am I getting too far ahead of myself? Adam, do we have announcements to be made tonight? Okay. Shake hands with one, one another. Love everybody. God bless you is my prayer. Listen, on the table in the foyer, there is those slips. Um, if you want to fill out one of them to donate to Frankie Tyson's ministry, if you weren't here this morning, fill it out and turn it in, and I will be sure that it gets to him before he leaves.